Well, again, it's great to be with you um, today. It really is. And uh, really um, love John and Becca. And um, it's great to see the church that they're now leading. And um, great to just share with you from this passage in Acts. You know how passionate uh, John is and I am about God's Word, the Holy Scriptures. Um, today, I want to join that to particularly a passion for prayer and a real encouragement to be a church that plugs into the power of prayer. Um, can I ask you as a church, do you believe in the power of prayer? That wasn't a rhetorical question. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Good, um, because it's so important. And you joining us online as well, I need to hear you uh, agreeing. Is that true? Do you believe in the power? Is that, is that where they're watching over there? Is it that camera? Great to have you with us as well. And I want to encourage you not just to say that, but to really believe it. Because I heard of a church in Texas in the US, and um, this probably is apocryphal now, but let's go with it. And uh, they were a Baptist church, and unfortunately, across the road from the Baptist church, a new bar, a sort of drinking bar, was opening up, and it was being built. And they actually were so cross that their church was going to have to look out onto a bar that they called prayer meetings to pray against this bar. And lo and behold, the night before it was about to open, it was struck by lightning and burnt to the ground, right? And the church were feeling very smug about this until the bar owner heard about their prayer meetings and took them to court, suing them for their responsibility in the demise of his bar, at which point the church denied all responsibility uh, for the destruction of the bar. And when this came before the court judge, he looked over the paperwork and at the hearing he commented, I don't know how I'm going to decide this case, but it appears from the paperwork that we have a bar owner who does believe in the power of prayer <laughs> and an entire church congregation that doesn't. <laughs> I think that's a challenge, isn't it? We say we believe in the power of prayer, but are we, I know I am, are you not surprised when God actually answers it? Do you know what I mean? Do you ever have those moments where we say we believe in it and it's like, oh gosh, that actually did something. And that's really the, the sort of, maybe it's always going to be a bit like that, but that's sort of the encouragement I want to bring. We believe in a God who answers prayer. And the more we, our faith stirs that that's true, the more we will give ourselves to the wisest investment a human can make, which is to spend time in the Holy Scriptures and out of the Scriptures to believe in the power of prayer. And so in this reading that we've had from Acts chapter 4, I want to just interrogate the passage a little bit, ask it some questions that hopefully will just unpack for us a fresh inspiration as we go into this Advent season. No doubt there are people you would love to come to know the Lord at this Christmas time, to encounter the risen, present Jesus. I want to encourage us to go into this Advent season freshly committed, individually, as families, and as a church, to prayer. It's the gift that God has given to us. First question we should ask of this passage is when. Uh, so if you're taking notes, there's just five questions. I've got quick fire questions. When, uh, who, why, uh, what, and how. All right. The first question is when. When did they pray? And the answer, as you can see on the screen, is after further threats, the Jewish rulers let them go. And on their release, they raised their voices together in prayer. That picture, by the way, is, uh, is an artist's impression of that scene in Pilgrim's Progress where they seem to be, where Pilgrim seems to be trapped by two great beasts, only as he steps forwards in faith to realize that the beasts are chained and there is a narrow way between them where they cannot harm him. And it's this idea that I want to capture visually that the church is under great threat at this time. The authorities have arrested two of their leaders. They've threatened them before they release them that they should never speak in the name of Jesus again or they'll be big trouble. So they are facing great threat. And I want you to notice that their first response, not their last resort, but their first response is to pray. And where does that kind of instinct come from? You know, if you're, if you're in the sporting world, you'll know that the reason that a sports, elite sports uh, men and women practice so much is because in a game situation, they want to have instincts that kick in that they don't even have to think about to do the right thing under pressure. And to get those, to cultivate those kinds of instincts requires practice. So this is a church... I mean, we know that the incident that's led to their arrest is the healing of a crippled man, and it was while they were on their way to the hour of prayer in the ninth hour that they performed that miracle in the name of Jesus. In other words, every day there's an hour given over to prayer. Every day they are practicing prayer so that when the challenging situation arises, their spiritual instincts kick in, and the first thing they do is to pray, to call the believers together and say, we're a people 
who solve our problems through prayer. I believe that's such an important thing for God's people today. We're a people who solve our problems through prayer. Our first response, not our last resort, is that we pray. And I don't know about you, I, I grew up in a home, a family, where this was how my father and my mother sort of raised us as children, really, I suppose, to expect that when we face challenges, we don't panic about it, we don't worry about it, we don't gossip about it, we, we pray about it. You know, and, and I'm not saying that was perfect, but I certainly had that instinct, and it's part of parenting, I think, is to build in instincts to our children. How do you respond? Life will be fearful at times. You will face risks and threats. How do you respond? Well, we respond in prayer. And I remember one occasion, probably the greatest threat that ever came across uh, my, my life as a young uh, boy was that my mother um, informed me that the school I went to, I needed a new blazer, but they were one of these schools where you had to buy the blazer from the school shop. You know the ones so you can't just stick the badge on, you know? And my mother informed me we didn't have enough money to buy me a school blazer. Now, forget what's happening in the Middle East, right? When you're a kid, that's a world crisis right there, isn't it? When you think you're gonna be the one kid going to school either without a blazer or with the wrong kind of blazer. So I remember feeling very fearful about this. At which point my mum informed me, but don't worry, she said, we'll pray about it. <laughs> and I remember just sort of chuckling, you know, inside, Pr pray about it. I mean, what's, a, what's God going to do? Make a blazer. It's the most ridiculous idea, isn't it? Pray about it. So anyway, she, I didn't pray. She prayed um, and I worried. And then we went into town, and I, I kid you not, I remember this so clearly. We pulled up outside a charity shop. We went into this charity shop, and there on the shelf, on the, on the rack, was the school blazer from my school, which wasn't even near this town in exactly the size that I needed. Now, I know, you know, that, what about, you know, I know all the kind of what ifs, but for me, that was a lesson. You know, as a family, we actually believe in the power of prayer. And when we feel anxious, even about very practical matters, we solve our problems through prayer. I don't know what that means for you right now, what challenges you're facing, but when we feel anxiety, when we feel uncertainty, may we be a people who instead of overly worrying about it or giving in to fear, we're a people who pray about it in faith. Amen? Well, that's the first thing. The second question, that's the when, did they pray? It was their first response, not a last resort. The second is who prayed? And notice uh, for this, the answer is very simple. Peter and John went to their friends and they lifted their voices together in prayer. Now, I know that for us, Peter and John have gone on to become apostles, um, great figures in the early church. But at the time, you have to remember, they were nobodies. In fact, the Jewish authorities that arrested them and then released them, they couldn't understand even how they had the ability to speak eloquently because they referred to them as common, uneducated men. These were not impressive people at the time. They were people that would have been mocked for being uneducated, for having a very <laughs> limited CV. I mean, probably illiterate. These were not impressive people. And it's these people, nevertheless, who call their friends together, simple, hardworking, honest folk, no doubt, and they just call them together and say, we'll pray about this. So I want you simply to notice that when we are insignificant, whatever our significance in society, when we pray, we become significant in the heavenly realm. Do you believe this? Because it's so important that we understand what's going on. When we pray in the name of Jesus, however weak and insignificant we feel here on earth, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realm and we lift up the name of Jesus and suddenly there is authority in his name vested in the most insignificant ordinary types of people. So don't let your ordinariness limit your faith in the power of prayer, because ultimately it's not about us, it's about him, right? So we pray with confidence because we are simple, many of us may feel pretty common, average people. But when we pray, there is an authority and a power that comes upon our prayers. We lift up our voices in the name of Jesus. Notice then they were common and uneducated, and they were men. I don't know, um, men, how you get on with prayer. Sometimes it's tempting to feel that that's something that, you know, that our wives should be passionate about. Or I, I don't know, what may, maybe that's not the case for you. But I want to encourage us, men and women, there is a call to be simply invested in prayer. And it's such an important intervention 
in the lives that we lead, to pray about our workplace, to pray about our children and families, to pray about our friends and neighbors, to invest ourselves in prayer. You know, on our knees is the most powerful posture we can adopt because God hears the simple prayers of common people. And as Charles Spurgeon used to put it, prayer then becomes the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. I love that idea. You know, we may feel we're so slender and weak, but you know how the nerve system is that which activates the great muscles in the body. God's muscles of omnipotence are activated by the slender, feeble prayers that you and I pray. And these were common, uneducated people. If you'd heard them pray, it would not have been eloquent. It would, it would not have been dotting all I's and crossing all T's. This would have been rough, simple, but honest and passionate prayer. God is not at all impressed with eloquence, but he is impressed with honest, simple, passionate prayer. Amen? Is that a call to prayer? <laughs> or is that the rag and bone man? All right, we'll move on, unless you've got anything you need to... Uh... Second, so firstly, uh, when did they pray? Secondly, who prayed? Thirdly, why did they pray? Well, they prayed, as we've seen, not because of who they are, but because of who God is. And they address him in these terms. Um, uh, if you go back, yeah, they, they raised their voices together in prayer. Sovereign Lord, they said. Sovereign Lord, they said. Now, notice that's the why. Notice the throne. Here is the sovereign Lord that they are calling upon in prayer. When we speak of God as sovereign, literally in the, in the Greek New Testament that the, this was originally written in the language of Greek, it's despotes is the Greek word from which we get our word despotic or, you know, and that negative thought in our minds is about humans that have uncontrolled, unaccountable power. But whilst that's a very dangerous thing, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and all of that, whilst that's dangerous for human beings, when it comes to a good God, we need to remember he has unaccountable, unrivaled, uncontrolled power. And so these weak, feeble people who are facing tremendous threats from earthly authorities, they let, lift their voices and they call out above and over the heads of earthly authorities and they say, ah, sovereign Lord. And then they go on to describe the sovereignty of God in a couple of ways. Firstly, he's sovereign over the natural created world. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it, they say, alluding to Psalm 24. Here they're calling out that God is sovereign over the wind and the waves, the land and the animals. He's got that natural power that we see uh, demonstrated or made visible through the manifest world around us. I don't know about you, but sometimes when there's a storm and you feel the power of the wind, when there's stars and you go out like last night and it's just crisp and clear, and you look up and you imagine what you're thinking about seeing up there. So it's, it's unimaginable, really, isn't it? You know, the, the scale of the universe. But some of these can be moments where we just recover ourselves a vision of how great our God is. He is not some village God that is limited in his power. He's the God who flung stars into space. He's the God who rules over the oceans of the earth. And it's this God to whom common, uneducated people are having divine access. They're coming through to a place where even angels wouldn't dare come to the throne of Almighty God, seated with Christ. They're turning to their Father and saying, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth. Notice in the ratio of verses here, it's very interesting this, we have about seven verses, I think, that record the prayer of the believers five of them are not asking for anything, but they're simply reminding themselves of how great our God is. <laughs> I don't know about you, but a five to two ratio is probably about right for our prayers. Take about five minutes to remind yourself of how sovereign and mighty God is, and then take about two minutes to ask him for the things you need. If we put the cart before the horse, prayer can just become sort of a form of worrying out loud, can't it? Because we've never really come through to a fresh faith in, in our mighty God. But when we get five verses of sovereign Lord, and then two that we'll come on to in a moment of what they actually need, those proportions, that sort of ratio is refreshing. Then prayer meetings are the most exciting place to be, because we're sensing the awesome power of God, and we're calling that power in the name of Jesus into our circumstances. 
They go on not only to affirm that God is sovereign over the natural world, in other words, the good creation, they also affirm that he is sovereign over evil. Did you notice that? They quote Psalm 2, this messianic psalm, and uh, they quote it to remind themselves, and again, notice that they bring scripture into their prayers. It's one of the bugbears of mine that so often, and I, I know that I, I used to do this as well, so I'm, I'm talking to myself as well, but so often we talk about having a time of scripture and then prayer, and what we do is we read a bit of the Bible, we close it, and then we think, right, what should we pray about? <laughs> you just read what, you know, this is, this is our guide. To, this is why, one of the reasons why we need to know the scriptures well is that they can inform and, and start to flow into our prayers, and they just capture psalm 22 they pluck it out of their memories perhaps i'm not sure they had scrolls open in front of them they just called to mind a psalm and they said in psalm 2 you know why do the nations rage the psalmist says and the people's plot in vain and they they think of that and they think well that's exactly what's just happened in jerusalem remember they are only a, a few a few months on at this stage from the death and resurrection of jesus and they're calling to mind the fact that the psalmist said why do they even bother trying to oppose God? Because when they oppose God, they simply end up fulfilling his purpose. And they think, well, that's exactly what's just happened in Jerusalem, right? Human beings did their most wicked and evil intention towards God's eternal son. And what did that achieve? The very purpose for which God sent his eternal son. They put him to death on the cross. And what do they say? As God predestined would happen. In other words, what they're saying is, God, you're not just sovereign over the good created order, you're even sovereign over the bad, wicked world. Even when human beings decide to turn against God, God is sovereign over their actions in such a way that in the end, his will and purpose will win out and not theirs. Why was this important? Well, because the human authorities were turning against this tiny, fragile little church. And it would seem like they were able to just steamroll them into oblivion. And instead, the believers say, no, but you are sovereign, Lord. You'll work even this persecution into something good. We're not going to buckle under the pressure. We're not going to give in to the fear. We're going to come out above it in prayer to our sovereign Lord, who rules over the good world and the evil within it. That is the absolute confidence of prayer. That is why we pray, not because of who we are, but because our God is sovereign. Amen? So that's when, and that's who, and that's why. But th fourthly, uh, what? You know, <laughs> for these two verses where they actually ask for something, what did they actually ask for? And this is so humbling. I mean, honestly, this, this is... Well, this is a counterintuitive prayer. Now, Lord, consider their threats, and before you click on to the next slide, I mean, what would you have asked for? Right? You're facing terrible threats from the authorities. Your family are in danger now. Well, now, Lord, consider their threats and please you know, take care of us. You know, um, help us to be a bit more appropriate and to stay out of trouble and just keep us safe. Amen. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with those kinds of prayers in one sense. God is our Father. He loves us. And when we're in danger, we can pray for protection. When we need something, we can pray for provision. We've just prayed together. Give us our daily bread as our Lord taught us to pray. So please understand me. There's nothing wrong with those prayers about our own personal needs. I think our Father invites that. But perhaps what isn't so good is where that's all we pray for, or even where that's the most important thing in our minds. In fact, what we find with the early believers is, whilst I'm sure they did go on to pray for protection, and they did need all of that, nevertheless, the first concern on their minds is, well, let's read on. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I mean, if you think about the context, isn't that incredible? They just got in trouble for speaking about Jesus. What do they pray for? <laughs> Help us to speak more boldly about Jesus. It's, it's counterintuitive praying. It's the absolute opposite of what you would expect. But here are some people who have come to a conviction. There is nothing more important than that Jesus Christ should be glorified by people coming to faith and believing in him. And so we will not back down. We will obey the authorities in every other way. But on this one, we will step out in faith and we will speak about Jesus Christ. 
when you encounter this kind of response, it really is quite humbling. I remember teaching a, a student who'd come over to the UK from Pakistan and not through me at all, actually, I didn't know him at this time, but as a Muslim from Pakistan, he'd become a Christian um, studying on another course. And because he'd become a Christian, before his visa, student visa ended, he wanted to take a short course in theology, which is where I did teach him, before he headed back to Pakistan. So here you've got this guy, he's going back to a very devout Muslim family in Pakistan, now as a Christian. And if you know anything about that context, that is not an easy or even safe um, prospect. So I called this guy, we'll call him James, and I called him and I said, you know, come and see me, I'd like to pray for you before, before he left. And I remember sitting down with James, remember he's a pretty new Christian, full of the Holy Spirit, but nevertheless pretty new to faith. He's just learning the ropes. And I said to James, you know, as you go back to Pakistan, what would you like me to pray for? I'll never forget his reply. He just looked at me and said, please pray that God would help me tell my family about Jesus. <sighs> Like, of all the things that I pray for, and here's this young lad, he's new to faith, he's going back to the most challenging circumstances, and the thing the Spirit has put on his heart is, help me tell my family about Jesus. That is a 21st century prayer that echoes this first century prayer, don't you think? It's counterintuitive, it's Spirit-filled, it's all about mission to the glory of Jesus Christ. Notice they go on even to pray for miracles. I don't know if you noticed that. It's very rare in the Bible, but nevertheless, it's there that they are actually praying for a miracle, for healing. God, stretch out your hand, they pray. They're asking not just for boldness to speak, but for demonstrations of the Spirit's power to transform the lives of people around them. Again, I encourage you to pray in faith for boldness to speak about Jesus, for miracles, however subtle they may seem, genuine encounters with the presence of Jesus for people this Christmas. Because we live in a world that is lost and dark and lonely and broken. And they need, people need to know Jesus Christ. And he wants to empower us, God's people, to speak and to act in the name of Jesus to bring salvation uh, to those that we love and know. I was standing on the touchline of another match, actually. Uh, in fact, I wasn't. I was sitting, we've got a camper van now. And I was sitting in my camper van and... Um, and uh, I, I managed to park it so that I didn't have to get out of the camper van to watch my son play football. You know, it was very convenient. I was going to make a cup of tea and just enjoy the game from within. And then this guy came and stood right in front of the window. So I got the only reason I got out of the camper van was um, to ask him to move, basically, because he was spoiling the view. <laughs> but as I got out, I did just feel that little nudge of God sort of reminding me that's actually not my primary concern right now, <laughs> is my view. And so as I, I ended up getting into conversation with the guy, you know, Charlotte and I pray every morning, God, show us who we can bless today in Jesus' name. You know, just pray that simple prayer. And honestly, it, your eyesight is different. And so I stood next to this guy and he began chatting and I began chatting. Turns out, actually, if you know, um, if you know John Hartson, the, fo the, the football player, it's his dad, um, Cyril. So anyway, <laughs> it turns out it was Cyril, Cyril Hartson, John Hartson's dad. Uh, since been reading John Hartson's biography that he kindly sent me in the post. But the, to cut a long story short, we got chatting, and I felt that the Holy Spirit just nudged me about something. So I said to this chap, I said, you know, um, is, is there a reason why you've, you've had your heart broken recently? And with that, he went very quiet and then filled up with tears. And we had this incredible conversation about some things that he'd been facing in his family circumstances. And all of a sudden, there's this openness. You know, he's now reading my book, and I am reading John's uh, book, John Hartson's book. He's on a journey to, to faith, I trust, and I'm praying for him now. But, you know, you notice that it, it's never just something that's all within our power. The Spirit's power is needed. He needs to give us boldness. He needs to give us compassion. He needs to give us even the, 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 the nudges and the words of inspiration. And this is what he wants to do, because there are broken hearts, right, all around us. There are broken hearts in this world, and the love of God through Jesus Christ, is what is needed. Well, finally, how did God respond? How, that, that's their prayer. That's what they asked for. How did God respond? Well, he answered their prayer. I mean, um, after the, they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Would you like a bit more of that? I know how much I would. Lord, uh, forgive my complacency and my own self-interest. And God, I pray for us today 
that you would shake us up freshly with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, this sermon needs to end in prayer. This, this sermon needs to become a prayer, and we just come to you now in prayer. We're inviting you, Almighty Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to send your Holy Spirit freshly upon us, that we may be shaken up. We, we recognize, Lord, it's not primarily the spiritual, it's, it's not primarily the civic authorities or our neighbors, or it's not primarily them that need to be shaken up, it's us. <laughs> you shook up your church, not, not those who oppose them, but your people. It's us that need to be shaken. Lord, shake us out of our complacency, out of our doubt, and out of our fear. And would you put in our hearts, I pray right now, maybe if you, if you know how much you long for a fresh touch of God's presence today, that you might be more on mission for Jesus Christ. Maybe you just want to reach out your hands in front of you as just a sign of openness. And I just pray, Lord, over everyone who's reaching out to you now, come, Almighty Father, drive out our fear and give us the holy boldness that you put into this first century church, that same boldness that you put into James and into so many others today. God, grant us this boldness that this Christmas, this Advent season, we might go out and see more and more lives touched, more broken hearts healed through the power of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to, um, I think, worship and sing a, a song to close, but I do trust that that's inspired you in your own backyards, in your own home, uh, and as a church. Let's be a people who plug in to the power of prayer. Amen. John.